Welcome to the Alex Jones Show on this Sunday, August 23rd, 2015. I'm David Knight, your host. Alex Jones is going to be joining us at the bottom of the hour. He's in Toronto. He had a speech last night. Uh, he spoke at a uh, function that uh, George Norrie had. He had a couple of guest speakers. Alex was one of those. And Alex is going to be joining us to talk about what happened as well as to talk about, uh, I'm sure he wants to talk about these uh, two heroes, actually three heroes, I believe, that stopped that attack in France. We're going to break down the details of that when we come back on the news. We have another kind of hero that's going to be joining us in the program in the second hour. That's Thomas Drake. You know, we've got heroes who fight the enemy physically. Uh, that's exactly what these fellows in, the, in France did in the train. They knew that it was do or die for them as well as for the passengers on that train. They knew they had to do something, do it quickly, or they would be killed. They said reflex kicked in. Of course, that's something that's going to happen with everybody, but also their training. They were trained as soldiers, and that's not to discount at all their bravery. Certainly, there was a lot of bravery uh, in that, what they did after they subdued the fellow, beat him unconscious. Uh, he had wounded the first uh, military guy pretty pretty uh, heavily uh, and actually almost cut off one of his fingers. I believe it was his thumb. At that point, however, instead of looking after himself, he was trained uh, to take care of others as a medic. He went to help other people who had been victims. A couple of people had been shot. One guy had a severe neck wound. He would have bled out if the soldier did not stop the bleeding. So that's the kind of selfless hero these guys are. We also have a selfless hero with Thomas Drake, an NSA whistleblower. You know, when you're a quiet hero, the kind that is doing the right thing when nobody is looking, the kind that has integrity and character, because that's the definition of character, doing the right thing when no one is watching you. It's very difficult to be in that kind of a position. We're going to talk to him about why he went to work for the NSA, why he became a whistleblower. What was he reporting? He began work on September 11th, the day of the attack. We're going to talk to him about how what he learned that was going on at the NSA, at the FBI, at the CIA before the attack. We're going to talk to him about what he was blowing the whistle about. We're going to talk to him about the disgusting parallels between the way he was retaliated for being a whistleblower, the retaliation against him, versus the way they have looked for every kind of excuse for Hillary Clinton. You understand that Hillary Clinton has been accused of mishandling classified documents. That was precisely what they came after Thomas Drake for. But rather than make excuses for Thomas Drake, they tried to lock him away for 35 years. He was only the fourth person to be prosecuted in that way under the Espionage Act. Of course, the first one was Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers. It's an interesting story. It's an amazing story. And I think that there was far more than the alleged mishandling of documents. It was actually comical when you look at the documents. Uh, uh, mass collection is your friend, that type of thing. These were training manuals. They should not have been classified in the first place. Some of them were not classified when he got them. Uh, and that was the same excuse that Clinton has, except that her emails are emails that are born classified, as we discussed on Friday. A former official with the organization that classifies documents for the American government says that when you have conversations with the Secretary of State and foreign dignitaries, or they have intelligence that has been collected on foreign dignitaries by the NSA, that is born classified. Everyone knows that that kind of intelligence does not need to wait for a sticker or somebody to, uh, to label that as being classified. So there's an amazing hypocrisy between these two cases. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about uh, the history of the Espionage Act. We're going to talk about the culture of trying to sell a philosophy of surveillance. One of the things that Thomas Drake did in the years before he went to the NSA was he watched carefully the Stasi, just as William Benny did. I think that's why he was so concerned about it. And again, joining us at the bottom of the hour is going to be Alex Jones. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Alex Jones has been in Canada this weekend. He spoke at a George Norrie event. Uh, in Toronto last night. He's going to be joining us, however, at the bottom of the hour. He's going to be calling in. And in the next hour, we have joining us Thomas Drake, one of the big NSA whistleblowers that uh, were concerned about the mishandling, 
I would not say that he was actually charged, alleged uh, mishandling of documents. But he and William Benny and others were concerned about the way the government was mishandling your information, violating the Constitution, the dragnet surveillance, the massive boondoggle, the massive waste involved in that. There were a lot of different aspects of things that they were concerned about. They went through official channels. They were shut down. Eventually, they went to the press. And then there was retaliation. Interestingly enough, from the same prosecutors that gave the banks no prosecution. Lanny Brewer, the guy who became famous for his too big to jail comments about HSBC. Remember, HSBC was laundering money for drug cartels, for terrorists. The Sinaloa cartel with El Chapo, remember him? He just escaped from prison. Donald Trump was talking about him a lot. Well, they were laundering money for him. He had his own private window at HSBC. HSBC and other big banks had been caught before laundering money. They had been given probation, a little slap on the wrist, not much at all. They caught them again because they didn't reform their processes, their procedures. That time they gave them a larger fine, still a very, very small fine concerning the amount of profit that they had made. And they said, we are not going to take away their charter. That would not serve the interests of the American people. And for that, everybody said, well, you're saying that they're too big to jail, just like they were too big to fail back under the Bush administration. Nevertheless, the same Lanny Brewer comes after Thomas Drake. And what did he come after him for? Well, he came after him for allegedly mishandling classified documents, not giving them to a foreign power, but allegedly mishandling them. Precisely the same charges that many people are alleging about Hillary Clinton. However, the, the information that Hillary Clinton has, both in quantity and in its classified nature, makes the three or four documents that they came after Thomas Drake for pale in comparison. It's not even close. I mean, he had things like uh, uh, bulk collection is our friend. We'll talk to him about the exact things, things that should not have even been classified, things that were employee handouts. It wasn't the private conversation with foreign dignitaries. So we're going to talk to him about what happened as a whistleblower, his concerns about the NSA, the dangers that he sees, because as I mentioned in the last segment, like William Benny, he spent a great deal of time watching East Germany and the Stasi. He knows what a surveillance state like, it looks like. He also knows that what we are capable of now is far more dangerous than anything that ever happened under the Stasi. So I want to talk to Thomas Drake because I want people to understand how there's a double legal standard here, how we have a dark double government, as he points out. People like Hillary Clinton can uh, do whatever they wish and get away with whatever they do. But people who point out the crimes of government are retaliated against like Thomas Drake. He also has something to tell us about 9-11. I'm very interested to talk to him about that as well. Now, we have some other heroes that we're going to be talking about here in just a moment. But before we do, those are the people who stopped the terrorist attack on the train. Before we do, I want to go over some economic news. These are a couple of articles that are up on Infowars.com. The global economy is officially melting down. They say as much as the financiers on Wall Street and the officials of the Fed would like to keep the party going, it looks like it is about to stop. This is from Joshua Krauss, the Daily Sheeple. He says, years of bailout and monetary expansion have created one of the most inflated and artificial economic booms in history. He points out the Dow has fallen 1,300 points from its peak. On Friday alone, it fell by 530 points, making it the ninth worst stock market crash in U.S. history. Another article we have says the two-day stock market crash this week was greater than any one-day stock market crash in U.S. history. It was an 888-point crash. Going on with some of the other metrics from this first article, he says the Shanghai composite fell by more than 11% this week. China's stock market has lost a third of its value since its previous peak. He says it's lost 4% of its value on just Friday alone after it was revealed their manufacturing activity had reached a 77-month low. That's over six years, about six and a half years. 400 of the world's richest people lost a total of $182 billion this week, amounting to 6% of their collective wealth. I won't be crying for them, but you have to be concerned that they will do something very dangerous. Just as we heard before 9-11, they need another Pearl Harbor. That works whether you want to build the size of the NSA or whether you want to 
shake things up so you can make money because they make money when things rise rapidly and they make money when things fall rapidly. They can go long or they can go short. They can buy into it or they can sell these things short. So they can make a lot of money if they create a massive crisis. One more metric here. They say commodities have fallen to a 13-year low. The price of copper has reached a six-year low while oil has suffered its longest decline since 1986. So that's the economic news. Very concerning because usually in August, it's very quiet. Things usually change in September and October. And we've had a lot of people saying they expected big changes for a lot of different reasons. A lot of people have different ways they forecast the economy. A lot of them expecting big changes in September. And we haven't even gotten there yet. We've got another week of August and already we've had massive moves. Also, we have some information about Planned Parenthood and the videos that have exposed the criminal, I would say, activities there. Court has now removed the injunction on the Planned Parenthood videos. That was an injunction that was put in there to stop them from showing any videos from STEM Express. They have now released the newest video of that. And, of course, what are they talking about? They're talking about people who are getting entirely complete babies. Lab recipients get aborted babies, they say, they go into shock when they open the box to find an, quote, intact case. In other words, a whole body. They say, yeah, if you got an intact case, which we've done a lot, we sometimes ship those back to our lab in its entirety. Tell the lab it's coming because they'll open up the box and go, oh, my God. Yeah, I bet they will. I bet they will. Now, there were massive protests yesterday. Uh, across the country against Planned Parenthood. There were over 300 protests that were set up on uh, Saturday. We have an article up on Infowars.com showing some of the Twitter feeds, showing some of the uh, pictures, people's reports about how many uh, people that were there. Louisville, they had some about 200 in Oklahoma City, they say. Over 1,000 in Aurora, Illinois. Over 600 in Lincoln, Nebraska. They say about 300 plus in Nashville. I looked at some of the ones in North Carolina from some of my friends that were putting them out. Charlotte. Had about 400 people turn out to that rally. In uh, Raleigh, they had about 100 people. And let's see, this is Greensboro. They had about 130 people. If you've got 300 rallies across the country and an extremely conservative figure of 100, which is the smallest one of those cities that I saw, and that was in Raleigh, that would give you 30,000. But, of course, there's some places that have 400, some places that have 1,000 people there. I hope we have turned the corner on this. I hope we understand, finally, the value of life. Like many people, I was sitting on the fence, not thinking about it a great deal. I thought of it as an individual's choice until we saw the, uh, the entire birth of a child except for the top of their head. A partial birth abortion, they call it. At that point, I realized that it was murder. And at this point, I think people are waking up to not only the profit motive of Planned Parenthood. And we've talk, talked to uh, Abby Johnson, who was a Planned Parenthood employee, employer of the year, a manager in Houston. She resigned because she realized that they were not just trying to help young women coming in there, pregnant women, to make a decision to give them treatments. They were pushing them towards an abortion. They had a quota that they needed to do. And she also saw ultrasound of a child that was being aborted and she saw it recoiling in pain, trying to get away. They told her, well, it's, it's too young to feel any pain. She saw otherwise. I think that America is having that kind of wake up moment. I certainly hope so. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. We're going to talk about what happened in the French train accident. And Alex Jones will be joining us at the bottom of the hour. Stay tuned. Alex Jones is going to be joining us in the next segment. He went to Toronto last night to speak to a at a George Norrie event. He was one of the guest speakers there last night, one of the featured speakers. He's going to be calling us to uh, tell us about that, and I'm sure that he wants to weigh in on the situation in France where there was a terrorist attack on one of the trains, a man with an AK-47, and he also had a pistol. He had a uh, box cutter with him. His AK-47 jammed. That's one of the reasons why these guys were able to take him down. But they didn't know that it was jammed at the time. They thought they were going to die. The crew on the Paris-bound train barricaded themselves in their staff room and locked the door. 
as he was going through the train. His 26-year-old Moroccan national, Air Force Airman Spencer Stone, ran at the gunman when he opened fire on the high-speed service to Paris. Also joining him was Oregon National Guard member Alec Scarlatus and Anthony Sandler from California. They were friends. And British National Chris Norman. They beat him senseless and tied him up waiting for the authorities. And, of course, Spencer Stone was uh, severely injured himself. He was cut several times with a uh, box cutter, and his thumb, I think it was, one of his fingers at least, was nearly cut off. Nevertheless, in spite of that wound, he went to the aid of passengers, a couple of whom had been shot. So these guys took the pistol from him, then they took the AK-47 and beat him with his own gun until he was unconscious. They say officials did not disclose a positive motive for the attack. <laughs> Do you think it might have been terrorism? That was the narrative for the first couple of days. I thought, who are they talking to in France? They, they don't know if this was a terrorist event. I mean, are they getting their information from Inspector Clouseau? <laughs> this, is, this is about as smoking gun as you get, folks. Uh, yeah, it was a terrorist event. Uh, one of the fellows that uh, was there, one of the heroes, said he had a Kalashnikov. He had a magazine that was full. My thought was, okay. Probably I'm going to die anyway, but let's go. I'd rather die being active. They say uh, one of the airmen, uh, the airman Spencer Stone, with his arm in a sling, recounted on Sunday how he and two other Americans tackled the gunman. He says it seemed like he was ready to fight to the end, but he said so were we. He's hailed as not only being the first to grapple with the attacker, that is Stone, but also for helping to stop the bleeding of a French-American passenger that was wounded by a bullet. That's the one that I mentioned, where he stopped the bleeding. The fellow could have bled to death. In the beginning, it was mostly gut instinct survival, he said. Our training kicked in after the struggle. And one person, the uh, U.S. ambassador, says of them, we often use the word hero. And in this case, I know that word has never been more appropriate. That's U.S. ambassador Jane Hartley. She says they truly are heroes. When most of us would run away, Spencer, Alec, and Anthony ran into the line of fire and said, let's go. That changed the fate of many people. And you know, there are heroes who do the physical attacks, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, and then there are those who are the quiet heroes. People like our guest in the second hour, Thomas Drake. He is someone who did, who did the hero's job, but did it in a way that is very difficult. So not to take anything away from the people who did this, who saved their lives, who saved others' lives, who risked their lives to do that. But we have to understand that Thomas Drake risked his life as well. He had a family. He had a son who was very sick. He had a secure position. When you're in a position of comfort like that, it's very easy to rationalize that you should just follow authority. You should just do what the government is telling you. It will all be better in the long run. Thomas Drake, however, understood the Constitution. He understood where this leads because, like William Binney, he had monitored East Germany and the Stasi for a very long time. And that hardened his resolve to where he would put his life on the line, doing it quietly when no one would see. But some people did see. I want to play for you what Edward Snowden said about Thomas Drake, our guest in the second hour. Here's what Ed Snowden said about him. Fair to say that if there hadn't been a Thomas Drake, there couldn't have been an Edward Snowden. Here we had a guy who did absolutely everything right. He placed his faith in the system. He saw, you know, the warrantless wiretapping of hundreds of millions of Americans. Uh, he saw uh, corruption. He brought it to the IG. He brought it to the Congress. And rather than protecting him, they actively retaliated against him in the, the most public and aggressive way. Yes, they did retaliate against him. They tried to put him in jail for 35 years. They came after him for mishandling of classified information. The documents that they accused him of mishandling were nonsense compared to what Hillary Clinton has. And for her, they look for every excuse they can not to prosecute her. We're going to talk to him about what he saw, what he blew the whistle on, what the dangers are to America, the different ways that those who run our dark and secret double government escape prosecution. We're also going to talk about the Espionage Act because I want to lay some of the history down on this for you before he gets here. So he'll be free to give you his story without getting burdened down with the 
uh, backstory of what went on with the uh, Espionage Act and what we have seen with that for a number of years. I want to tell you about that. I also want to tell you about how the TSA is coming to the movies. Before I do, real quickly, we have a limited time special at InfoWarsLife.com. 30% off Silver Bullet or you can still get two Silver Bullet Get Two Free. We brought that special back along with 30% off of a single bottle to let you give that a try. Of course, Silver Bullet is our powerful colloidal silver product. It's free of artificial additives. It's perfect for your preparedness supply. It's a great time to stock up on it when you can get it either 30% off or 50% off if you get uh, two bottles of it. It's concentrated to 30 parts per million. It's in a pure base of deionized water. There's a reason that listeners have dubbed Silver Bullet as their preparedness silver. So right now is a great time to get it with this sale that's going on. You can get that at InfoWarsLife.com, 30% off of one bottle, or buy two, get two free. Now, where is this all going to lead, of course? Where is the surveillance state going to lead? It's a gradual, incremental movement. Just as I pointed out on Friday when I talked about the people who are reacting to the manufactured crisis of the open borders. And it is a manufactured crisis. It's manufactured like all of these crises are. They create a crisis. They use that to show the problem. They use that to expand the government over and over again, whether it is the NSA and the Patriot Act or whether it is going to be the kind of movement controls that we're, I'm very concerned about in many different areas. I'm looking at what the government is planning in terms of controlling our movement, our transportation with autonomous cars, constantly tracking, constantly reporting our movement, able to shut down our movement if they wish. Do we really want to give them that capability at the border? Do we really want to throw fire on the uh, fuel on the fire of the TSA telling them, yeah, you're the transportation uh, authority. We want you out on the highways. We want you especially down at the border. Do we really want to do that? We need to understand that just like gun control, when there's a tragedy, the politicians will use that tragedy to try to push for gun control. In the same way, we see the Republicans using tragedies, violent crimes that are committed by illegal aliens, using that to push for more security theater. The wall will be absolute theater, but the high tech behind the population tracking will not be theater. Stay with us, we'll be right back with Alex Jones, Thomas Drake in the next hour. As I've been mentioning, we're going to be joined in the second hour by an NSA whistleblower, Thomas Drake. The only one of the whistleblowers who was prosecuted by the government. They alleged that he had mishandled documents, not anywhere like the document mishandling that we've seen from Hillary Clinton. They said that he had obstructed and destroyed evidence. It turned out that he hadn't. The entire case folded the day before they went to court. They were scolded by the judge. And of course, the person who was overseeing the prosecution was Lenny Brewer, the same guy who let HSBC and all the large banks walk, said they're too big to jail, essentially. Obama said, well, there were some laws that they didn't break. Yeah, there were some laws that they didn't break. That's not to say that they didn't break a whole lot of laws that they really should have gone to jail for. Someone should have gone to jail for it. They got a very small fine. Hillary Clinton, so far, nothing is happening to her. She still is a pretty popular candidate. She's still the candidate to beat. She's taken a hit in some of her popularity and some of the other uh, politicians who would like to take her place, like Governor O'Malley, former Governor O'Malley, says we have to look to the future. He went on to uh, the... NBC show, actually it was ABC he was talking to, and he said, uh, we cannot allow our party to be branded by those sorts of questions of the past. Uh, that's actually a pretty good description of Hillary Clinton. She is a question of the past. Uh, he says, we have to look to the future. We have to offer ideas and move our country forward for the future. That's why it's important to have debates. But of course, you're not going to have any debates on the Democrat side as long as Hillary Clinton is a candidate. Everybody is going to be debating her history. There's a lot of history with Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of skeletons in her closet. But it is absolutely astonishing, astonishing to see how they are avoiding prosecution for Hillary Clinton for the very serious classified documents that she really did mishandle, for the obstruction of justice that she engaged in, and see how they came after they, they invented these charges and tried to send Thomas Drake to jail for decades because he had blown the whistle on corruption 
on waste and on criminal activity. He and William Binney and others were exposing the fact that our government was engaged in massive surveillance that they had changed the rules after September 11th. He actually began on September 11th. We're going to talk about September 11th. We're going to talk about the parallels with Clinton, and we're going to break down the history of that. Before we do, though, I wanted to uh, take a look at um, what is happening at the at the TSA. But actually, we're going to be joined now by Alex Jones, who is reporting from Toronto, Canada. Alex. David, I am standing here um, from an island off the coast of Toronto, Canada, looking at people uh, having a great time playing tennis, playing badminton, uh, swimming in uh, one of the major great lakes here. And it, it's so picturesque, and it just really makes me, at a very deep fundamental level, want to protect these people and to want to warn them about what's happening. And it is the fact that people are so innocent, so nice, so friendly of every race, color, creed, nationality. They all just want to have good lives, healthy, happy children, uh, contribute to the world. Uh, they want to help other people. Are really, really good. And it's because... People historically are so blind to the fact that, that that true evil exists in the world that it's able to grow and able to breed. And, you know, you're up here uh, seeing this for yourself. It's people of the same. And it's so sad. It's also very positive for some good things. Obviously, it's a race uh, event to a capacity crowd of wonderful people. Uh, took about two hours last night at the meet and greet afterwards to shake uh, about a thousand people's hands. And these folks were so awake and so impassioned and are taking action on so many fronts. It was booing. And so the good news is, yes, the general public is still somewhat asleep, but exponentially they're waking up. And that's why the globalists are accelerating their programs right now, as you know, David. There's a lot happening. Uh, I was going to be back today, uh, but because of flights and issues and getting up here late, uh, I am now coming back tomorrow. But I will be uh, filing reports in the morning and live during the show tomorrow with David, uh, actually from my Skype computer uh, before I go to the airport. So I will be co-hosting part of the show tomorrow. Just wanted to give folks an update on that. But what's amazing is when I walk down the street in Austin, Texas, again, this is just a gauge of how awake the world is. As I've said hundreds of times, the average person who isn't well-known in the liberty movement doesn't know that people all around they don't have a way to have sonar or radar or, or recognition to match that. I do. And I carry over to the airport. I think we're losing Alex there. It's, it's breaking up. He's calling us from Canada. Again, he was uh, reporting about the event there uh, that he had, he spoke at, one of the featured speakers there. I think the key speaker, is he back? We, okay. Go ahead, Alex. Yes, again, I am calling you via cell phone because I'm calling from this uh, island. Um, it's, it's, uh, the south, not the city of Toronto. And so I've only got a few cell bars here. I'm not going to take up too much more time, but I did promise to call in and report on the show today, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, bottom line, just now, taking a few minutes off uh, to swim um, in this great lake, I, I had no fewer than five people of a beach of probably 30 people, because it's, it's not that busy, come over and shake my hand and one lady was from Canada, another guy was from the U.S., another lady was from uh, Argentina, uh, her husband's a big listener, uh, other folks who barely spoke English were like Alex Jones, Alex Jones from China. I mean, this is what's really exciting is that the awakening is exponential, and no matter where I go, uh, we are running into people that are awake, whether it's Europe or whether it's Canada or whether it's Mexico or whether it's Honduras. People are awake, and of course, there's so many other people waking folks up that have listeners and supporters on the world. I'm only one small gauge of that, so that's the really exciting news. The bad news is this looks like some type of tit for tat. This China explosion, now this U.S. military base explosion outside Tokyo, still going off as we speak. Uh, just ultra massive uh, event. 
There's all sorts of black ops going on. Henry Kissinger has come out and said that oh, basically Obama screwed up, pushing Russia too far, and, and made us look like the bad guys. Of course, he, he wants to take over. He just doesn't want to fail. And so there's a lot of good things happening, a lot of bad things happening. But we, you know, we had Mr. Dent and other guests on in the last two months saying they believe the collapse is coming in September or October. And we just had Dent on two weeks ago, and he said within two weeks he would expect the bubble to start collapsing again. There was a dead cat bounce according to his graphs. Well, we just saw a thousand point drop on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And even though they try to prop it back up, it shows. And people say, well, it's a bubble. It should go down. Well, absolutely. The problem is we're in trouble even in a bubble. So so people are waking up. There's some good things happening. Uh, the globalist agenda is failing with Russia. Not that Russia's perfect, but we want there to be a multipolar world, not a single ring to rule them all, Mordor. We want diversity. We want firewalls of nation states against globalism. So a lot of positive things are happening, David, as you know, but also a lot of really negative things are happening as this cascade of events races towards an even bigger event in the near future. George Soros and the White House have revealed that Hillary Clinton is involved with her senior staffers, uh, as well as Nancy Pelosi staffers with Black Lives Matter, uh, trying to stir everyone up and get everybody fighting with each other. Uh, it really is an amazing thing to see what's happening in all these different confluences of events. The, as the stars align politically are coming up. And the good news is, just take the abortion videos. Just take those, David. Oh, absolutely. Notice how, notice how 70 percent of people in polls or higher want to stop these abortions now. And so notice they've gone in, they've gotten the videos, and they're heroes. I mean, good people can push back. And I know- Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. I'm coming to you from Lake Ontario, one of the great lakes. I'm out there on a little island. I decided to take uh, half the day off and come over here and investigate and talk to folks. And let me tell you, it's one of the prettiest places I've ever been. This is an amazing creation that God made. And I just look at the people, the little dogs swimming. Uh, I'm in the interior of the small island now. There's people playing badminton and just hang out. It's like a small town here. Uh, the houses look like hobbits could be walking out of them any minute. I'm, I'm here to tell you I'm not being paid by the Tourism Board of Canada. Uh, but this is definitely somewhere that I'm going to be taking the family uh, vacationing next summer. Now I know why so many Texans like to come up to the Great Lakes in Michigan uh, and Minnesota. Uh, but also right up here in Canada, this is this definitely takes the cake. I have a really serious next hour coming up. I'm joining you via cell phone. David Knight is in the radio slash TV studio in Austin, Texas. I want to thank him for the fabulous job, not filling in, not sitting in for me, but doing as good a job or better than I do. But uh, again, I will be back tomorrow. David will be co-hosting much of the show with me, but I'll be co-hosting from Canada. I'll be back tomorrow night. Trying to get back to what I was saying earlier when my cell phone was cutting out. What I'm getting at is this. We are at a critical crossroads. Everyone knows that. We keep warning everybody about it. And now it becomes clearer and clearer that we're right and that serious things are about to break loose. The good, the bad, and the extremely, extremely ugly. And so now is the time to get our houses in order, to get right with God, to be thinking about what's happening, but to also try to change the destiny of the world by taking action. God gives us free will. God sets out a course and a general path and works through good people, the corrupt forces to the bad. But we decide much of what happens in our universe, in our world. And I'm glad I went on this trip because I would never watch a children's movie like Tomorrowland, especially because George Clooney's in it, even though I was in a movie he produced, A Scatter Darkly. Uh, I figured it was all global warming propaganda because of the ads I'd seen, and, and I probably should have gone and seen it. I just I just can't stand more propaganda. Well, I ended up watching it on the plane because I decided to do some research. I said, okay, I'll watch it. Bit my lip. Something told me watch it. Overall, I've got to really watch this film again and do a whole report on it. Very positive on the surface. Uh, it exposes revelation of the method, a breakaway civilization that is called the greatest minds of children since the 1940s into a breakaway program 100 times bigger than the Manhattan Project uh, that is operating outside uh, of the general public's knowledge on government reservations. 
and they've decided to go ahead and not uh, uh, give people the advanced technology. They've decided to keep the life extension and everything else for themselves. And in the process of that, uh, because of the brain drain from the planet uh, into the elite, the world is about to basically destroy itself with nuclear war with their computer probabilities. But then they basically are able to take out the bad guys, the elite, that want to hoard all the power for themselves and are able to reverse the probability of humans destroying themselves. This film is extremely powerful. I don't know if it's good or bad. It's very, very heavy. It's cheesy. It has product placement in it, propaganda placement, where all the heroes are women. And, of course, that's a new directive. I'm not against one of the heroes in movies. I have two daughters. I love it. The problem is it's a directive admitted uh, by the United Nations UNESCO program. If folks look into that, video games, you name it. So it's all part of our media being controlled. So this is a propaganda film, but it's also the elite saying that they were basically wrong and that they don't want to kill everybody. It's kind of like the last Superman movie was the same story about eugenics. So are they conditioning us so we're subconsciously ready to accept it? Uh, or uh, are people re rebelling within the system and putting films out like this? The only bad thing is it puts out a very truthful message so that you subconsciously take it in People already know subconsciously about the breakaway civilization. The problem is that it then puts the lie of global warming at the heart of it and the way to save the Earth. So uh, very, very sophisticated propaganda. I'm going to have to really watch it again and come to my final judgment. Uh, but it is extremely uh, heavy uh, and uh, is about human empowerment, the final equation. I think that's why the film probably didn't do too well, uh, and a lot of folks didn't really understand it. Uh, because it's uh, dealing with some things uh, that are so real world, it would make your head spin. But that's basically it. I've got a lot more to report on the show tomorrow where I'll be in the hotel room. So it'll be nice, clear, you know, uh, HD audio, probably video with David Knight. And then, Lord willing, I'll be back in the U.S. tomorrow. Uh, again, just the super good news. It's the super good news that people are even more awake, it seems, in Canada uh, than when I see in the United States. Uh, just patriots are everywhere. So don't feel alone out there, ladies and gentlemen. Keep speaking out. Keep taking action. Uh, we can turn this thing around with God's help, but we have to take the first step. And I want to thank everybody also that supports this broadcast, the wonderful team we have. It is such a blessing, all the affiliates we have. There is a ton of news, obviously, coming up. Um, I filed a report uh, on Saturday. Seems like a million years ago, but it was just, just yesterday. Um, well, it was actually Friday evening when I first got to uh, Denver, because that's where I flew through. And they had reported first it was two Marines that had tackled and stopped uh, the shooter. And, of course, later they said it was one Army, one Air Force. It doesn't matter who they were, whether they were military or not. They took action and took the gun away from the guy and then, and then got cut up by his box cutter but stopped him. And that's such an important story, because do you really believe on not one, not two, but... Three different aircraft on 9-11 that everyone didn't fight back. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not the toughest guy around. But if people jump up with box cutters or whatever on board an airplane with me, and there's three of them I'm going to fight back if I'm by myself. I mean, think about it, folks. If you're on a plane and you're rude to some guy, he'll threaten to kick your butt. I mean, people where I've grown up and all over the country, you mess with them, they'll fight you. I don't care what color they are, where they're from. Uh, I just fundamentally don't believe 9-11 because of things like that, but also the FBI admitted that none of the high-altitude uh, uh, phone calls were, were really made. The only real ones were from air phones, and both stewardesses, flight attendants, said there was gas, smoke. They couldn't breathe. They were being nerve-gassed. We don't know exactly what happened on 9-11, but we know the official story isn't true, and we now know they're suppressing Saudi Arabian involvement and our government standing down. But again, the good news is the truth is coming out. Well, thanks for putting up with me on cell phone. Sorry to David and the crew. I tried to get to a place where audio Skype would work. But the whole next hour is going to be extremely informative uh, with a major whistleblower. Don't you have a big whistleblower coming on, David? Yes, Alex, we have Thomas Drake. He was the only whistleblower from the NSA to uh, have the, uh, the Justice Department try to put him in jail. Of course, it was Lanny Brewer, the guy who said the uh, banks who were laundering money were too big to jail. But they came after him for the same things that... 
Hillary Clinton has been doing. They allege that he mishandled classified documents. He really didn't, but she really is, and they're doing everything to avoid uh, going after her. Wow. Yeah, of course, we've got Hillary that's in deep trouble. Uh, we've got 9-11 coming out. We've got uh, the insider trading coming out all over the world. Uh, we've got the, 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 the Vatican being blackmailed coming out. I mean, really, everything is being revealed. They're, they're cut the floor right out of the water now that they've announced. I mean, really, David, we're having victories on every front. So I want to thank the audience because you are the heart and the tip of the spear of the Liberty Movement worldwide, InfoWars. You are the power, the listeners of this transmission. What a brain trust. What an honor. Uh, and what a responsibility for all of us. David Knight, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to turn the show back over to you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Alex. And again, that's Alex Jones reporting from Toronto, and he'll be joining us tomorrow on the radio program as well. As we pointed out in the next hour, Thomas Drake is going to be with us talking about his experiences, what he saw at the NSA, why we should be concerned about the encroachment on our freedoms, the destruction of the Constitution. He had this to say when he got an award from the Sam Adams Associates for Integrity Intelligence. He quoted uh, from Frederick Douglass and part of uh, Frederick Douglass's 1857 speech and basically paraphrased it. With some references, he said, power and those in control concede nothing without a demand. They never have, they never will. Each and every one of us must keep demanding, must keep fighting, must keep thundering, must keep plowing. We must keep on keeping things struggling. We must speak out and speak up until justice is served, because where there is no justice, there is no peace. He put his life on the line. It ruined his career. They tried to lock him up for the rest of his natural life. This is a man who is every bit as much a hero as the people who charged the gunman in that train this weekend. We're going to talk to him in the next hour. In the next segment, we're going to lay some background of the Espionage Act, because he's one of the few people who have been charged with that. Most of those people who have been charged with the Espionage Act have been charged by the Obama administration. More people than all the previous 100 years of presidents combined. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, your host today. Joining us in the next segment is Thomas Drake, NSA whistleblower. He is the fourth person to have been charged under the 1917 Espionage Act. This is something that, as Bloomberg points out, since 2009, President Obama has charged nine people under the 1917 Espionage Act with passing classified information to media outlets. This is something that was never done before. There were only two people prior to that. The first person to be charged in that way, of course, is Daniel Ellsberg with the Pentagon Papers. The Nixon administration went after him. When this was passed in 1917, Woodrow Wilson said this was going to go after naturalized citizens. In other words, this is not for you, Americans. Don't be worried about this. We're going to get involved in foreign wars for the first time, and we're going to pass all kinds of censorship rules, but this is not for you. This is for naturalized citizens, he said, who have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life. But, of course, that's not the way it's being used now. It was rarely used to go after alleged leakers of classified information until 1973 when they went after Daniel Ellsberg. Prior to that, they had... In the, war, in the time after World War I, they had gone after people who had passed information to foreign powers, people who were spies. In 1917, however, it was a little bit different. Shortly after they passed this Espionage Act, they used it against Eugene Debs. He was the person who was a five-time presidential candidate for the Socialist Party. And a lot of people talk about that, how because he was opposing the war... He was targeted. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He served five years before his sentence was commuted. But I want to talk to you about the second person who was charged under the Espionage Act. This is a man, Robert Goldstein. He produced a film. That's what he was charged under the Espionage Act of Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson for. The film was The Spirit of 76. It was done in 1917. It was about the American Revolutionary War. It was a silent film. He would later go to prison for making this silent film. Let me tell you why. Woodrow Wilson had a lot of pushback against being involved in foreign wars. We now have an American empire that is doing one undeclared war after the other. We have multiple wars going on at the same time. They're pushing so hard to try to start a war with Russia that even Henry Kissinger is pushing back against this. 
He's a globalist. He's a long-term globalist, but he doesn't uh, want to see even that. So even Henry Kissinger is pushing back against what they are currently doing right now. It is absolute madness. But in 1917, Woodrow Wilson was trying to convince the American people to break with a longstanding American tradition of avoiding foreign entanglements. So he was very sensitive to anything that would undermine what he perceived to be the rah-rah patriotism of the war. This film... 76, Spirit of 76, premiered in Chicago in May of 1917, just one month after the U.S. entered World War I on the side of Britain. The head of the Chicago Police Censorship Board, and get this guy's name, Metallus Lucullus Cicero Funkhauser. <laughs> That's actually, but more importantly, the fact that there's a Chicago Police Censorship Board. They confiscated the film at the behest of the Justice Department on grounds that it generated hostility towards Britain who were our allies at the time. Goldstein trimmed the offending scenes, and he received federal approval to continue the Chicago run. And the offending scenes were things showing uh, British soldiers bayoneting babies, things that uh, largely fictional, although there were a couple of uh, real massacres that were depicted in the film. Nevertheless, it was over-the-top uh, fiction in the film. And Woodrow Wilson thought that it would turn people against our British allies. So he excised that in Chicago. But when they premiered the film in L.A. a few months later, the deleted scenes were then restored. After an investigation, the government concluded that Goldstein's actions constituted, quote, abating and abetting the German army. They seized the film. They sentenced him to 10 years in jail, a $5,000 fine. Understand, that'd be about a half a million dollars today. And... He couldn't claim the First Amendment because the Supreme Court had ruled in 1915 that movies didn't fall under First Amendment protection. Interesting, isn't it? They overruled that in 1952. Another illustration of how we cannot trust the Supreme Court to be honest about the Constitution. But Thomas Drake is honest about the Constitution. He'll be joining us right after. Joining us now is Thomas Drake, one of the NSA whistleblowers that went public about the dragnet surveillance and the way that the NSA was ignoring the law, ignoring the Constitution after September 11th. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Drake, but before I do, I want to let you know that Super Male Vitality is back in stock. We've been sold out for weeks. You can now get that at InfoWarsLife.com. We're now taking orders on this emergency shipment. We have hundreds of five-star reviews there. You can take a look at those reviews at InfoWarsLife.com. We also have Survival Shield X2 Nascent Iodine. Over 400 reviews on InfoWarsLife.com on nascent iodine. 99% of the respondents would recommend this to a friend or family member. Go to InfoWarsLife.com, take a look at those reviews, and you can get both Survival Shield X2 nascent iodine and Super Male Vitality. Back in stock at InfoWarsLife.com. Now joining us now is Thomas Drake. Mr. Drake is a whistleblower who has dedicated his life to safeguarding his country. He's a 10-year veteran of the Air Force. He specialized in intelligence. He served as a CIA analyst and a contractor for the National Security Agency, the NSA, for 12 years before joining full-time in 2001. And actually, it was on September 11th was his very first day there, unlike Chris Christie, who says that he joined on September 11th. We'll talk about that. When Drake saw mass waste and abuse at the and billions of dollars being spent on Operation Stellar Wind, he took his concerns to superiors in the NSA. He tried to go through channels. He was stonewalled by his superiors in the NSA. Nothing happened with the congressional reviews. After a while, he thought that the public had a right to know. So he took this to a Baltimore Sun reporter. He made legal disclosures of unclassified information. She wrote a series of award-winning articles that exposed the billion-dollar boondoggle at the NSA. Then the empire struck back. We saw a reprisal. Drake was ratcheted up to the maximum criminal prosecution they could get under the Espionage Act. Of 1917, the government conducted an armed raid of his home. They interrogated him for hours, confiscated his personal notes and computers, threatened him with spending the rest of his natural life behind bars. They charged him, of course, with retention of classified material, not disclosure, not passing it to someone else. And so we're going to talk to him about the parallels in what they accused him of and what it appears that Hillary Clinton has done. But before we do that, uh, welcome, Mr. Drake. Uh, thanks for having me. I wanted to, I, I really appreciate you coming on. You're one of my heroes. I, I can't say that enough. Someone who put their life on the line because you understood really what was at stake. You've 
for many years, you watched the uh, Stasi operating in East Germany, just like William Binney did. You were very concerned about where we're headed. And I look at this, and there's so many Americans don't really see the danger in what is going on and how we're slipping into this uh, dark surveillance state. What can you tell us about what you saw with uh, the East Germans, with Stasi and state, and, and what uh, you're concerned about happening here in America? What are the dangers? What is it going to be like for Americans? Well, the dangers, we don't learn the dark lessons of, of our own past, and you know that's rather recent history, uh, how easy it is to drift into dystopia and you know, let others take over and, and take charge. And you know, that, was, that was a police state. Uh, it reigned with fear. Um, it kept enormous records on the essentially the entire population, as well as many other people outside of East Germany. You know, I didn't spend all those years, you know, listening in on the communications of East Germany without it affecting me in terms of what it meant for history. And I just never imagined that I'd find myself, you know, shortly after 9/11, uh, essentially find discovering that the United States. It sort of borrowed the playbook, as it were, uh, from the Stasi, and under the uh, cover of 9/11, which is you know an enormous failure. Although some would say it was, you know, you don't let never let a crisis go to waste. In the infamous words of Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff for Obama, for Obama um, never let the crisis go to waste. And so uh, they ended up suspending the Constitution, and part of suspending the Constitution is the actions they took in the deepest of secrecy that I ended up uh, finding out about. And it was Pandora's box opening up. And when you're staring into Pandora's box, the deep abyss stares back at you. And you have, you have that choice, your own moral agency as to what you do. You could attempt to close the box and, and the lid on the box and act as if nothing happened, or do you actually take action? And I had taken an oath for the fourth time. Uh, to support and defend the Constitution, you know, a piece of paper, but it's the fundamental principles in terms of how we govern ourselves. And I would not break faith uh, with that oath. I would not. Um, and you had a very, sign. you had a very comfortable existence. You had a family. I, I read that you had a, a young son who was sick at the time. I mean, you're looking at this, and you've got to make some hard decisions. You're doing this in secret, as I was pointing out before, and in parallel to the heroes who took down the gunman on the French train. They said they were acting on instinct, and of course, they see this guy's going to shoot them, going to shoot everybody if they don't do something. But you're in an environment where it's very easy to just take the easy way out to rationalize that this is what the people in authority want, and so I should uh, do as I'm ordered. Uh, you're, you know, you've got to be feeling those kinds of pressures to rationalize that. I think there's a lot of people that don't see the, the uh, long-term view of what's going to happen with this. It's very easy for people to rationalize that and to say, I want to, I want to stay comfortable, I want to take care of my family, I'll just obey the government, I'll, I'll, I'll be a good citizen, I'll be very quiet. Right, but citizens have a fundamental responsibility. Yes. Um, they really do. And if you don't, guess what? Don't be surprised at others who are more than willing to uh, abscond with power um, and then end up having power over you. Uh, History is not kind uh, when it comes to power exercised um, abusively over others. Uh, we've, we've just seen way too much in, in human history. It's sometimes challenging even for me, even today, um, not to get too cynical about all this. On the other hand, you know, that arc of history does bend toward justice. I know it may be uneven and it may divert and may take tangents at time. Uh, it does it does bend. And there I was. I mean, that was a moment of truth for me, uh, frankly. And it's, you know, it's what I've shared. I realize I can I serve as inspiration for others. I realize I was able to hold off the government. I you know, realized I did not end up in prison for all that they attempted to do with me over a number of years uh, to punish me so severely for literally speaking truth to power. Um, so... But those well, you, are choice, choices that are made, and you know I'm sta standing up uh, in in the public interest and for history. You know, you're an eyewitness to secret history, recognizing those choices that were made by the highest levels of our government, up to and including the White House, would have enormous downstream strategic consequences. You know, when I look at uh, you and I look at the other whistleblowers, like Jesslyn Radek, who was a whistleblower herself and wound up defending you and others, uh, John Kiriakou, uh, William Binney. I haven't had the pleasure of talking to uh, Jocelyn Radek or, or John Kiraku, but I have had the pleasure of talking to William Binney. 
And I think many of us on the outside, when we look at these, the dragnet surveillance of the NSA, when we look at their retaliation against Jew and the fact that they never do anything to come after the people who are committing the crimes, so the crimes are exposed by whistleblowers like you. Instead, they re retaliate against you. So we look at that and... and Many of us on the outside say, well, you know, this is just a, a nest of snakes. But when I see you and I see William Biddy and I talk to you, I understand that there are some good people on the inside. And, and that is one of the things that it gives me hope. It really does give me hope to see principled people like you, principled people like William Biddy. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction to this, uh, Mr. Drake. There was something that was revealed in the Snowden leaks. Uh, it was put up on the Intercept. It was a document. Asking, are you the Socrates of the National Security Agency? I don't know if you saw this article or not, but it was something that they had floated around internally. They wanted people to look at this and to uh, make a case for mass surveillance, for the government watching everyone. And this individual, it reminded me of the Stasi uh, situation in, in uh, East Germany where everybody was spying on everyone else. Everyone was paranoid and concerned that, that we're being watched. And one of the things that he says, that one of the many thoughts that continually went through my mind, and this is an NSA employee, was that if I had to reveal part of my personal life to my employer, I'd really rather reveal it all because partial revelation uh, might lead to misunderstanding. And so he says he embraced total surveillance of him because he thought it would exonerate him. That's an amazing, I want to get your reaction to that because it's, it sounds to me like Norman Bates in the basement of the uh, police station after they caught him. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Thomas Drake, an essay whistleblower. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we have with us Thomas Drake, an essay whistleblower. I want to go through the chronology of what happened with him as he was one of the few people in our country to be charged under the Espionage Act for allegedly mishandling classified information, something that Hillary Clinton is notably not being charged for. But before we do, I wanted to ask Mr. Drake, um, Mr. Drake, I, I came across this thing as we were talking about before we went to the break. This is a document that came out of uh, the Snowden leaks reported in The Intercept. And I want to read you this quote of what this NSA employee said. He said he was concerned that if people knew only a few things about him, he might seem suspicious. But if people knew everything about him, they would see that he had, they had nothing to fear from him. He said, this is the attitude I have brought to SIGINT work since then. I mean, I look at that, and is that the attitude you saw at the, uh, East, uh, in East Germany under the Stasi? Is, is that a mindset that you saw at the NSA? Well, it's certainly those uh, you know, that serve, ser uh, serve the secrecy system and the secrecy regime. I mean, this is where national security, I have to remember, is like, as I call it, the state religion. And you don't question it. It's, it is your authority. And uh, when you're subject to it and serving it, then you confess uh, all there is. You give up your sovereignty uh, to the state. And that's precisely how the Stasi operated. Remember, they were the, short and, the short sword and the shield of the state. Uh, they were not operating the best interest of, of people. Uh, in fact, uh, people were considered to be uh, threats. There, anybody was suspicious, including people even within their own system. Yeah, um, that was one of the things we saw with uh, Chris Christie in the back and forth with Rand Paul. He said, well, of course we have to do dragnet surveillance on everybody. Otherwise, how will we know who, who we have to come after? I mean, yeah, everybody I is guilty. They have to prove their innocence. They have to vet themselves. And that's, that's the attitude we see from this guy inside the NSA. And that's the attitude of people like Chris Christie and those who, who prosecute this dragnet surveillance, isn't it? That's why this has far less to do with you know, terrorism, which has been the cover and color for all of this as the excuse. And it's far more about social control. Ultimate yes. mass surveillance is about social control. Yes, yes, it's absolutely. I don't have to elaborate. I don't have to get into philosophical discussions about it. That's precisely what it is. Absolutely. I, I will also have some questions here. People who have uh, on Twitter using the hashtag Ask Drake, they've given us some questions. So I want to go over some of those as well. But first, let's lay out what happened in your particular case. So you began at the NSA. You've had uh, an intelligence background within the Air Force. Uh, you've also worked with them off and on. But you began work. Your actual first day that you report is September 11th, 2001, as that is all happening. Uh, tell us uh, what you were brought in to do and, and what you saw there. Well, in some ways, I was you know an accidental hire. Um, however, the 
Congress in particular, the key stakeholder uh, overseeing NSA, had been grown very, very concerned over the intervening years, particularly in the post-Cold War era, about NSA's viability, its ability to remain relevant. And it was increasingly having difficulty keeping up with the challenges of the digital age and Internet. And so they put a lot of pressure on NSA, and NSA very reluctantly and digging in their heels, uh, went, went ahead and decided to uh, hire people from the outside. And that's be meaning people that were not brought up there, were not promoted to the senior ranks from within inside their, their own system. And I was one of about a dozen people that were hired in over about a six month or so period just prior to 9-11. And I was hired in as a senior change leader. That was actually my uh, first title. And I reported to the number three person. Wow. And 9-11 was my first day. I was about 10,000 people um, in terms of signal, the Signals Intelligence Directorate. It's the offensive side of NSA. And I was to get to know the ropes, fo follow the Signals Intelligence Director around, uh, make recommendations, uh, help NSA um, move into the 21st century. There have been a number of failures. There have been a number of studies um, that they were falling behind. And increasingly, the choices they were making was to simply marry themselves uh, to the military-industrial complex and spend billions and billions of dollars uh, to buy the solution instead of taking the very best of American ingenuity and innovation, you know, of necessity being the mother of invention, uh, very, very low-cost programs that have super high impact and put that very best into the fight. And, of course, that uh, low-cost, very effective program was the one that William Benny had done called Thin Thread that essentially didn't make the haystack bigger so it was hard to find the needles. It actually helped you to find the needles, but they, they passed that over for a program that was done outside, and that was Michael Hayes' decision. Is that correct? Well, that was a fundamental choice. It was a buy versus make decision he made in uh, spring of 2000. It was about a year and a half before 9-11. He just said, hey, you know, I'm just going to spend billions uh, with, with the military intelligence congressional complex, as I put it. Mm -hmm. uh, as Bill Benny says, the happiness management complex. <laughs> um, and just spend, and that's, it was, it was an extraordinary amount of money. And so people are, you know, belling up to the Trailblazer bar. Trailblazer was the the main flywheel contract that NSA was going to use to catapult itself to the 21st century. It really became a funding vehicle for all kinds of contractors uh, and never did deliver. It actually uh, died uh, in 2006. But of course, uh, it involved a lot of companies like IBM, SAIC, Boeing, CSC. They made billions off of this, right? But this, I mean, as I said, 9-11 became a profit center uh, for any number of companies. I mean, this, this mm -hmm. goes all the way back. This is something Eisenhower, interesting enough, actually warned the nation about during his farewell address, uh, which was largely ignored at the time, but it's become one of those uh, points in history in terms of a warning uh, to the nation, because he realized that what he had unleashed from the 50s would probably have uh, negative consequences going forward, that in essence, you would be beholden to secret power and vast amounts of money to be operating not in the public interest, but operating in its own political and self-interest. Absolutely. So and power protects itself. I mean, this this yeah. is one of the simple things that I tell people. You have to remember this kind of power, especially secret power, especially power involving military, especially power involving intelligence. Intelligence itself, you know, information is power. And when you can control that, when you can make money off it, when you can sell it uh, with yourself and to others, well, then you you know it's very it's very heady. Mm -hmm. And so you want to protect that power. Not too many people can uh, can come around that without being corrupted and sucked into that. That's why well, we... that's where Lord Acton I, you know, power does tend to yeah. corrupt. Doesn't yeah. mean it will corrupt, but it tends to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, I want to talk about nine eleven. But before we do, I want to finish this chronology. When you're there, key things then that you're blowing the whistle about eventually are this massive, wasteful program that is also ineffective. I guess when we look at this, when we talk about a lot of uh, medical issues, we always look about safety and uh, efficacy, right? Is this medicine going to kill me? Uh, that's why we have the Constitution trying to keep the government from killing us. And then we look at it, are, is it going to be effective to try to get the bad things, uh, you know, to, to, to get the bad guys, okay, to get the disease? And so you were showing that this was, uh, you were concerned that it was violating the Constitution, that it was ineffective, that it was a massive boondoggle. So in 2004, is that about right? You go to internal channels to try to uh, get something done about that? 
Actually, I started much sooner. I was actually blowing the whistle with my immediate supervisor, the number three person, the Citadel's intelligence director, within just weeks of 9-11. Oh, okay. That's right. Uh, yeah. I'm looking at my notes in 2004. That's when the inspector general produced their final report. So that was after, so quite a bit of that had gone on. We're talking to Thomas Drake, an SA whistleblower. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We were just talking about how, as he began... Working at the NSA, his first day was September 11th, 2001. He noticed that things had immediately changed. The rules of the game had changed. Mr. Drake, uh, talk to us about how things had changed with the FISA court, for example. Well, that was just one of a number of uh, secret orders uh, that were issued uh, from the White House as well as the other command authorities uh, underneath the White House and the executive branch of the government. I don't think people yet fully appreciate precisely what 9-11 triggered. I said, that, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, 9-11 was the trigger in which the government in secret suspended the Constitution, and we've been operating under emergency powers ever since. Every time I say that, uh, people just stare at me. Most people still stare at me in disbelief. They just can't imagine that, that happened. But that's effectively what did happen. Yes. And that's precisely what I confronted. One of the things they just tossed overboard... Uh, and through through aside was the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act, the, the secret the secret court uh, that was actually created in 1978 because under the Carter administration because of severe abuses of executive power against Americans and violation of the Constitution in the the previous decades. And we of course, you and I are you and I are about the same age. We grew up watching uh, the the situation with Richard Nixon. We grew up watching the Church Committee hearings, the Pike Committee hearings, brought to the public's attention for the first time even the existence of the NSA. They've been secretly created by an executive order by by President Truman. And when Pike asked the NSA director to show the charter that was created by executive order, he refused. Pike was absolutely amazed. He said, "We're giving you billions of dollars." of uh, funding here, and you won't even show us the charter that presumes to authorize you? I mean, that's that's the way the NSA began, isn't it? There was no such agency, never say yeah, anything. Exactly. I mean, for all of its prowess, and it, it's there's a, a lot of history that has still yet to be written. You know, it, it was an intelligence agency. It was a military intelligence agency. It, it, it wasn't formed by Congress. There was no legislation. There was, there was no bill signed into law by the president. It was literally the stroke of a secret pen. Uh, in 1952. And people just don't fully appreciate what that means and how easy is it uh, to abuse that power. And, you know, that came to a head in the 70s. That, that's why for me, you know, I grew up as a very young teenager during the 70s. And I remember all of all those abuses of power unfolding. People forget that the articles of impeachment uh, that were that were actually um, formulated, you know, in the House of Representatives, you know, the against uh, President Nixon included using instruments of national power uh, against the American public in violation of the Constitution. And, you know, we ultimately had a president re resigning his office. Uh, of course, Nixon, you know, later said, as you may recall, uh, uh, during the interviews, the Frost interviews, uh, that you know, if the if the president says um, it's 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 not legal, then it's okay. You know, it's it's legal. I mean, if it's if he says it's okay, it's legal. Yeah, and um, along those lines, I want to play this clip for you and get your reactions again. We've had Michael Hayden bragging about what he did in the aftermath of this. This is a clip from Washington and Lee University, and of course, we've had a lot of discussions about Section Two Fifteen of the Patriot Act. They claim that that authorized them to retain uh, all this information from Americans to do dragnet surveillance. The question being, of course, uh, the Patriot Act, uh, it, does it itself obviously violates our, our rights under the uh, Constitution. But this is what Michael Hayden had to say about Section 215. Oh, your talk today about two, 215? 215 is such a safe haven. 215 is legislated by Congress. I was doing metadata collection under the president's raw Article II authorities from October 7, 2001 forward. That's just so amazing to me. Every time I look at that clip, the arrogance of Michael Hayden saying, ah, 215, that was a safe haven. That was done by the Congress, of course, in violation of the Constitution. Then he says, I had orders from the president. He points to his chest. What do we call a, a system of government where one person makes all the orders, Mr. Drake? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it comes under different names, but uh, you know, <laughs> tyranny, uh, totalitarianism, 
when you combine it, you know, what, what people don't fully appreciate yet is extraordinary partnerships that uh, NSA engaged in, had even before 9-11, with a number of telcos um, and other information technology companies, but particularly the telephone companies. Uh, they've had those partnerships for a long, long time. Those are greatly expanded after 9-11. You know, that's, that's a fascist system. Um, this is what happened. I mean, he, he's actually chortling about what he, the powers that he had yes. before things had to be put back into the box once they started being exposed in the press. Yes, that's, I guess that's one of the things. Raw, you know, raw he, executive authority is yes. not the form of government I took an oath to support and defend. In fact, that's an alien form of government that is a direct threat to our republic. Absolutely. And you can see how much he loves that power in that clip and the, the other times where he's bragged about this. So you see this is happening and immediately you start talking to people internally, going through proper channels. This takes a very long time. And in 2004, the DOD inspector general produces their final report. Tell us about that. Well, the final report, that had to do with the, the thin thread and trailblazer requirements. And you know, it was a secret report. There never was a public version made until shortly after the conclusion of my criminal case, many, many years later. Um, but uh, that that report uh, made it clear that you know Trailblazers was an utter failure, and many billions of money, billions and billions have been spent. But that was just one of the channels that I that I uh, where I blew the whistle. I also was a material witness and whistleblower for two 9/11 congressional investigations. But all of my material evidence, all of the the depositions, the the, uh, the the oral testimony, all of it was censored and suppressed. In fact, as I found out later, um, the only record that exists that anybody can find to date, now we're talking thirteen over thirteen uh, years later, is that I was interviewed. All wow. the all the actual evidence uh, apparently is buried. What so does they, that tell you? It was so secret that it couldn't even be in the the secret report of the joint inquiry. <laughs> So they swept all that under the rug. They kept well, remember, it secret. Look, the the yeah. Constitution has been suspended. I mean, yeah. I, this is what I confronted the general counsel on at NSA. I said, you're asking me to accept that in, in, in the name of national security that we can just simply set, set aside the Constitution. I said, there is, a, there is a constitutional means in this country. If the laws aren't working or the laws are insufficient, we, have, we, have, we go to Congress. And he said, if we do that, they'll say no. And what you don't understand, Mr. Drake, we live in exigent conditions. This is emergency conditions. It was the ends, the ends, you know, justified the means. And so we just need the data. And they be, it was just extraordinary. It didn't matter where they got it from. It was just, and they had the authority of the president. Yeah, yeah. Literally. So we live in an emergency. So follow orders. So obviously yeah. something like me getting in the way, standing up, is going to be a marked person. And, you know, I was targeted very early on as, as a troublemaker. I was targeted very early on as a threat. Uh, to the orders that are being handed down. And, of course, they kept this very secret. The vast majority of NSA did not know that there was this whole other program in which they had literally turned the United States of America into the equivalent of a foreign nation for vast dragnet electronic surveillance on an extraordinary scale, a scale that has still not been fully revealed to this day, in spite of even the Snowden disclosures, in spite of the disclosures that I made, in spite of the disclosures that others made, although more information has been coming out. And, of course, that's one of the things that scares us so much is the idea that uh, they're at war with the entire world, including American territory. When we look at the indefinite detention uh, without trial by the U.S. military, as you pointed out, of course, the NSA uh, began and continues as a military intelligence organization. Those are the things that uh, keep us awake at night if we actually look into this abyss. And I, I want to talk to you, too, about uh, geospatial intelligence and, and some of those aspects of, of tracking uh, our activity uh, looking at our metadata, what the consequences of that are. We have so many things to discuss. I wish we had more time. I want to continue on, though, with what happened with your prosecution sure. when we come back. And uh, after you try, you hit this stone wall of secrecy. In 2005, you contact a reporter and you send her some emails and it exposes some of what is going on. And then the retaliation starts. When we come back, we're going to talk to Thomas Drake, and NSA whistleblower, about how that retaliation looked. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going through the chronology of what happened to him. And I, we're about at the point where they come after him and allege that he mishandled classified documents. Amazing parallels to what's going on with Hillary Clinton. And amazing the hypocrisy that we see in our government. We're going to go right back to Mr. Drake in just a moment. Real quickly, I want to let you know that we have at InfoWarsLife.com a special today. 
Uh, 30% off of Silver Bullet. If you buy one bottle, if you buy two bottles, you can get two for free. That's 50% off. That's our 30 parts per million colloidal silver and a pure base of deionized water. There's a reason listeners have dubbed Silver Bullet as their preparedness silver. That's in stock right now. It's a good time for you to stock up. You can get it, again, for 30% off a single bottle, or you can buy two, get two free. That's at InfoWarsLife.com. Well, Mr. Drake, we were just talking about what happened. You, you go to the uh, NSA. You began on September 11th, and I want to get to that in this final segment that we have with you as well, uh, what you saw there. You saw dragnet surveillance. You were concerned about the constitutionality of that. You were concerned about the massive boondoggle waste that was happening. You went through internal channels. You went to the House. There was a report filed. It was kept secret. The public was not notified. Then in 2005 now, we get to this point, you go to a reporter at the Baltimore Sun. Uh, she writes uh, about what has happened with some of the information that you gave her, non-classified information that you gave her. Now they get into retaliation mode. And in 2007, they raid you, they raid Mr. Benny and others. Tell us about that. Yeah, I actually contacted the reporter for the first time in uh, late February of 2006 anonymously. I was well aware of the surveillance system. And it was clear that when the James Risen, Eric Lichtblau article was published in December 2005 in New York Times, revealing for the first time publicly the existence of the so-called warrantless uh, wiretapping program, uh, that there, people like myself would no doubt become targets uh, if they launched an investigation. They did that two weeks later. Long story short, myself and my colleagues and others became targets because uh, we were some of the few people that actually knew about the stellar wind or what, what came under the president's surveillance program that had been you know in the operating the deepest of secrecy since shortly after 9-11. Long story short, I was put under extraordinary surveillance, physical and electronic. Um, and my colleagues were raided unceremoniously and searched uh, in July. And then four months later, I was getting ready to go down to the National Defense University where I was uh, teaching. And I looked out my window, and there's a dozen FBI agents streaming across the, the front lawn, and that's wow. when the nightmare began. Wow. Wow. And, and you know, even though this has been, uh, this has been released by the whistleblowers and after your prosecution, as late as 2013, we had James Clapper still lying publicly to Congress when Ron Wyden asked him about this dragnet surveillance. He says, no, no, not to my knowledge. And that, that was just a few months before Ed Snowden's documents came out. They were still maintaining this line six years later that they weren't doing this. Now, tell us what they came after you for, what they well, alleged that you'd be saying. about a lie. You know, it travels yeah. you know, just That's about right. all the way around the world before truth even gets its boots on, right? They go chasing <laughs> after it. So you just wait for the lie to come around, and then you just, you know, kick it. <laughs> that's, when you, that's when you notice it. It gets in the way, right? It runs right into the truth, right? <laughs> that's right. Never let, I mean, even though they, they have, uh, all this has come out in your trial, sure. you know, years before, they, they're continuing to hold to this line. And tell us about these documents that were supposedly classified that you were charged with willful retention of. I mean, I'm looking at some of these titles. What a success. Regular oh, meetings. Right. Volume is our friend. I mean, this is the kind of management development stuff that you have to set through in some of these corporations, you know, as part of a requirement. You're, you can't stay awake. This is ridiculous. This is not anything that is even serious. It was all a frame job because yeah. they wanted to burn somebody. I know from inside sources, Cheney had sent out the edict, fry, but you know, find and fry somebody, make an example of them, burn them. And I was, they actually thought that I was a ringleader uh, for disclosing the secret surveillance programs, the program they wanted to, d to keep way off the radar. Uh, the last thing they wanted to people to know was, was the public. And so uh, they came after me with everything they had. And uh, ironically enough, it's the very documents that in whole or in part I had given to government investigators looking at Thin Thread, uh, Trailblazer, and 9-11 and intelligence. And they're all unclassified. And so ultimately, you know, they took them. They forced you know, forced classification uh, review, decided they were super top secret, that uh, many of them would cause exceptionally grave damage to the United States of America, the site now security United States if it was disclosed. And then it took them uh, from November 2007 all the way until April of 2010, now under Obama, not under Bush, but under Obama, to find a way to uh, indict me. And they indicted me under the 1917 World War I Air Espionage Act. 
And that's, of course, been a favorite of the Obama administration. He's indicted more people under that act than all the previous presidents for the past hundred years combined. Uh, Lanny, Lanny Brewer was the one who oversaw your prosecution. Of course, he was the one who let the banks uh, who were doing money laundering for drug cartels and terrorists, he let them go saying they were too big to jail. How do you feel about the parallels between your case and what's going on with Hillary Clinton? It's it's surreal. <laughs> I have to tell you, it really is. And, you know, I've had some, you know, some, some really interesting flashbacks just seeing all this play itself out. Um, you know, part of me realized the vice grip of national security that she's in. And, you know, this is you don't trifle with classification. You don't trifle with secrecy. And this is it's a sort of like, you know, this is hardcore religion, right? You're in violation uh, of the doctrine. You're in, vi you're, you're in violation. Now, having said that, there is clearly a double standard. Yes. Right. A huge double standard. Oh, so huge. in my case, blowing the whistle, not leaking, because leaking is not done in the public interest. Most of blowing is, you know, yes. threats to public safety or health, fraud, waste, abuse, violations of law. So whistleblowing in this case, criminalized because you're revealing government uh, misconduct and wrongdoing and violations of law, including violations of the Constitution. But hey, you get to play with the information and s send it to your buds and use it for political purposes. We're going to protect you. And of course, what Hillary Clinton did, William Leonard, his former director of the Information Security Oversight Office, that's the people who do the classification stuff. Uh, he said that uh, the stuff that you had should have never been classified. I mean, there's the things like we mentioned before. Let's yes. have regular meetings. Volume is our friend and everything. On the other hand, Hillary Clinton has got intel from foreign leaders, uh, conversations she had with them, or intercepted yes. intelligence that the NSA got. That's the kind of stuff that she has. And the same man who said that your stuff never should have been classified, uh, that they tried to uh, hang you on, William Leonard said that there's a lot of stuff that Hillary Clinton had that is born classified, whether it was marked that way or when she put it onto her computer or whether that was done later. Uh, precisely. No, I mean, this again, this is why it's so surreal. We're talking about operational intelligence. We're talking about uh, conduct you know, of of, for, of foreign affairs, uh, high, very high level diplomacy. You're you're talking about other other channels of information that are extraordinarily sensitive. We've only got and about. Here she is on a private server, you know, and she apparently it turns out there's a lot of people that she was communicating with via that means. Absolutely. And and so I think, uh, yeah, there is a, certainly a security violation in her case. It certainly was retaliation in yours. Now, we only got a couple of minutes left, and I, sure. I really wanted to get to this earlier. On 9-11, you pointed out that you saw that there was intelligence that the FBI, the CIA, the NSA had information that they could have stopped this beforehand. Tell us about that. Well, in summary, there was critical intelligence that was never shared properly never acted upon, in some cases deliberately so, uh, that could have stopped 9-11 dead in its tracks. And that's just that's just from the NSA side. That doesn't count a lot of the other uh, failures or, or um, cover-up of, of information that should have made it uh, for action. I mean, look, the, go the government is supposed to provide for the common defense, and it utterly failed. You know, the entire system was designed after World War II. We would never be surprised again. You know, the quote-unquote, never would it, will you again have an electronic Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet it's clear that it was also used, you know, there was the Cheney and company were looking looking for an excuse. I have to say that. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of a lot of the theories about 9-11. I'm just saying when I was at NSA, you can imagine the, the shock of discovering critical intelligence reports uh, with, that unfold the entire Al-Qaeda network, which I shared with all the investigators, by the way, at the time that I had it. Um, when, in fact, uh, if they had been shared it properly, it could have stopped 9-11. And what does that tell you? So 9-11 happens, and yet they're, you know, they're too big to fail, and all oh, it was a huge intelligence failure. And <laughs> look what unleashed. Okay, that's, that is the consequence of not providing for the common defense. 9-11 happened. They knew, as you point out, they had information. They could have stopped it. They could have looked. They could have made counterintelligence a, a bigger priority. They deliberately made that a low priority. But, of course, I believe that as, as we look at this, and, and uh, Senator Graham has also said there's too many coincidences just to write this off. There had to be somebody kind of quarterbacking this. I mean, what do you think of, of things like, for example, Building 7, which just happened to fall down without even being hit by a plane? Uh, well, there's a lot of controversy about that, you know, but also has a lot of secret operations. We're out of time. Thank you so much.